Homer's Iliad, the story of the Trojan War. Actually, it's not the story of the Trojan War. Uh, maybe we should say the story of Achilles. Well, actually, it's not the story of Achilles. It's specifically the story of the anger of Achilles, um, but I'll get to that later. But it's what we associate with the Trojan War. So we're, we're, we're still in the, the region of Greece but, uh, that we were in when we talked about Hesiod's uh, Prometheus and uh, Aeschylus's Prometheus, but we're backing up a little bit. Uh, we're no longer in uh, 7th to 5th century Greece. Uh, we're backing up in time to uh, a text that was written sometime in the 7th century probably, but uh, it's describing events that happened five centuries before that. Uh, Homer, if there is a Homer, and I'll get to that in, in a minute, is writing sometime between 750 and 600 BCE. That doesn't mean he lived 150 years, that just means that somewhere in that window. Uh, it's, uh, it has been a matter of debate who came first, whether it was him or Hesiod. Uh, debate usually swings toward Homer as probably being the older of the two. But they're, they're writing around the same time. Toward the end of the, the, the Greek Dark Ages and at the, the beginning of the uh, the sort of new rise of the, the Greek city-states that will culminate in the fifth century uh, BC uh, cities of, of Athens and Sparta and Thebes and, and others that are more well known to us today because of the art and philosophy and that sort of thing. But Homer's writing in the Iron Age, uh, a time when you know iron technology is uh, the, the, the major uh, new technology at the time, which distinguishes it from the Bronze Age, uh, the, the, the previous millennium. Uh, so Homer's writing closer to the time of fifth, the fifth century civilization of Aeschylus and Socrates uh, than to the time that he's describing in the Iliad. Uh, so this time period is called, the, the time period of the Iliad is called the Bronze Age because uh, you may notice from the descriptions that most of the weapons and armor are made out of bronze. Bronze is easier to smelt, to melt down and to reforge, uh, although that means it's also softer and, and easier to strike through, to damage than, than iron will be. Iron technology exists, but it's kind of clunky. You can make sort of large, heavy objects with it, but you wouldn't be wearing uh, an iron breastplate or you wouldn't be carrying an iron sword. They'd be too uh, heavy and too you know, hard to really fashion into the specific types of, of weapons that you need. In the Bronze Age of the Iliad and before, the, the Eastern Mediterranean was dominated by three superpowers uh, that we've seen already. These were the Egyptian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, Mesopotamia, which will later be uh, replaced uh, by the Assyrian Empire of the same area, uh, and then the Hittite Empire, which became a major player around the 17th century BCE. Remember that the Hittite Empire has been a military threat to Mesopotamia uh, as well as to Egypt in the, uh, the time periods we've discussed before when we talked about Gilgamesh and Atrahasis. Uh, it has also been trading with these other empires. It has learned writing, uh, especially. Uh, it has adopted cuneiform writing on clay tablets to its own language, and so we have clay tablets coming from uh, the Hittite Empire. Uh, and we have clay tablets uh, from this, uh, this time period, from the city of Hattushis, which was the, the capital of the Hittite Empire. Uh, and one of those, or some of those tablets, are fragments of the Middle Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, which uh, date all the way back to uh, around 1500 to 1300 BCE. So this is a, a major empire, it's a literate empire. Unfortunately, we may not have heard of it uh, as much as the, um, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians because, well, it's, it's not really described in the Bible. We have a couple of Hittites uh, reference, but they're single individuals because they had disappeared as a power by the time the Bible was written. The Hittite Empire is located on the uh, peninsula of modern day Turkey. Uh, and at the time it was, or later, uh, before it was Turkey, it was called Anatolia. And at the, the western edge of this uh, landmass, uh, where it comes into contact with the Aegean, uh, there was a city that the Hittites in their cuneiform text called Wilusa or Wiliusa, uh, and it was in the region of Ashua. Well, this word Ashua shows up in Greek and it's where we get our modern word Asia. So when we talk about the continent of Asia, we're talking about the largest continent on the globe, but the term itself originally referred to this place, uh, this uh, western end of, uh, of Anatolia. And it later becomes called Asia Minor, uh, and then, which implica implies that everything east of it is the larger Asia. But this word, uh, the reason the Western Europeans know Asia as 
everything uh, east of them is because if you look at where the Greeks are, uh, the, the modern uh, nation of Greece and going all the way back to the, uh, the ancient Greeks, they looked east and they saw to the east of them was Asia and everything beyond that they just said was more Asia. Uh, it wouldn't be until Alexander the Great pushed the boundaries of the, uh, the, the Greek civilization uh, all the way to India, to the Indus River, that they realized how many more cultures there were each step you, you go through. Uh, in fact, that word Indus, uh, that one river, is where we get the, the name for the uh, modern nation of India. Uh, because Alexander the Great just sort of said, well, everything beyond the Indus River is India, and the religion they, uh, they practice and the, the language they speak is Hindu. Well, Hinduism uh, as a religion refers to lots of different religious practices, uh, and there were lots of different Hindu languages uh, at that time. But the Greeks just sort of said, well, everything beyond this point must all be the same. Uh, well, it's the same th sort of thing is happening with the, the name Asia. So, uh, but this land was described by the Hittites themselves as Ashua, and to them it was to the west. And in this area of Asia was this city of Ilios, or sorry, Wilios in Hittite, but the Greeks would have pronounced it as Ilios. And this is where we get the word Iliad. Uh, the word Iliad for the, the poem refers to the city of Ilium, which is another name for the city of Troy. Uh, and it looks like the city of Troy uh, or Troy as a name probably described the larger land area, whereas the city itself was called Iliad or Ilios. Uh, throughout most of the Bronze Age, this city had a population between 5,000 and 10,000. And we know that because starting in the 19th century, uh, this uh, area was rediscovered. Uh, it was, you may have learned in, in history class, it was rediscovered by a, an amateur archeologist named Heinrich Schliemann. Actually, it wasn't Schliemann that discovered it, he was told where to look when he went uh, to, to Turkey to, to find uh, the, the city of Troy. Uh, someone who owned the land that this archeological site was on said, there it is, you should dig there. And he actually did more harm than good because he destroyed a lot of the, the area that actually contained the, the artifacts from the, the time period that we were looking for. But subsequent archeologists have, have dug through this area, and, and you can visit, uh, visit it today. It's, it's just south of modern-day Istanbul, and it's the, near the city of Hisarlik in Turkey. And the, the walls you see here were buried for, for years. This, you can tell that there's this flat land, uh, and there's this hill, which is a strategically, militarily uh, strategic site, so you wanna build your fortification up on a hill but as archeologists have spread out the digging, they found that there's a lot more uh, down around this area. So it was actually a relatively large place for a long time. And when I say long time, uh, it goes back to around 3000 BCE, so a good three millennia uh, it existed and it, it continued to exist on into about 500 CE or AD. But it existed in broken up time periods. Uh, it didn't just sort of consistently exist as a city through all this time. Uh, something would happen, there were, uh, this was an earthquake prone region, uh, there would be attacks sometimes, whether from starvation or uh, economic reasons or whatever, I, the city would be abandoned and then it would later be resettled because it's a very strategic area. Uh, it's strategic if you look at the map, you see that to get from the Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea, you have to sail up through the Aegean and then go through this narrow passageway uh, that uh, the city of Troy overlooks. You have to go up through the, the Hellespont, uh, which has remained a, a militarily strategic uh, area all the way in, during World War II. This was a, a site of heavy fighting between the Allied and Axis powers. And if you could keep that fortification there, protecting a, a naval force, uh, even a small naval force, that could stop merchants from going back and forth from the Black Sea uh, where they might be going to trade and then bringing uh, goods and, and wealth back through that uh, narrow channel. You could tax those merchant ships for passage and that would make you know, whoever controlled Troy very wealthy just by uh, being able to tax the merchants that pass back and forth. Uh, you could also control uh, naval uh, conquest. Anybody, who wanted, anybody from the, the Mediterranean who wanted to go attack a city that was on the coast of the Black Sea would have to pass through here and they also would have to pay tribute to whoever occupied Troy. So we can see why this is a strategic place to be held by the, the Hittite Empire. But we also see how far removed it is from the capital of the Hittites at Hattushas. Uh, and Hattushas is uh, a sort of landlocked so uh, 
to travel there, you would have to travel over land, which took, at that time, a lot longer than traveling by sea. So, like I said, Troy existed in different forms between uh, about 3000 BCE to about 500 CE. And the earliest versions were just a small hill fort. And then uh, something would happen, and then a, new, uh, uh, a little while later, a new city would be built on top of the ruins of the old, and then something would happen to that city, and then later a new city would be built on top of the old. And archaeologists have divided these into nine different uh, eras and nine different time periods when it was occupied. And it's somewhere between the sixth and seventh that corresponds to the time period that Homer was describing. Uh, so Troy VI, uh, and specifically it's Troy VI H, because each one of these time periods sort of divides up into smaller times. Uh, Troy VI H was destroyed by an earthquake around the year 1300 BCE. And the fact that it was destroyed by an earthquake is significant because uh, you haven't come across it in your reading yet, but when we get to the Aeneid of Virgil, uh, it seems that Virgil is uh, describing older sources when he has Aeneas see that the god uh, Neptune, which corresponds to the Greek god Poseidon, is destroying the walls of Troy. And uh, Poseidon is not just the god of the sea, that's what we probably remember him for, but he's also the god of earthquakes. And if he's destroying the walls of Troy, that indicates that there's some connection with a destruction of these walls uh, by earthquake. Well, that was Troy 6H. That was the, the version you see recreated on the right. After that was not quite rebuilt, but sort of patched up, the, the Acropolis there, the, the palaces that were guarded by that large wall you see in the picture on the right, uh, all the people that lived down in the, the area below it seemed to have all have to go, had to go into those uh, walls and what had been palaces occupied by just a, a single family or a few people, now uh, new walls started to be building up. Uh, new walls had been built uh, after this earthquake and it seems that many more families were occupying the same large area that one family had previously occupied. That seems to indicate that the people in the village down below are under siege and they've all been moved into this um, much more uh, well protected uh, area at the top. And that's what we refer to as Troy 7A. Uh, Troy 7A uh, was destroyed by fire around the year, somewhere between 1250 and 1220. And we know it was destroyed by fire. Uh, we also know that there were arrowheads found in the walls and uh, in, in public places, places you wouldn't just store arrowheads. They're scattered across the city from about this time. And they're a specific type of arrowhead that is found in the Aegean, that's not found in the Hittite Empire, not found in the Black Sea, not found in Egypt or Mesopotamia. So it seems that there was a lot of uh, arrows being fired around this time during Troy 7A, or at the end of Troy 7A. Uh, also, there are bodies left out in the street from this time that had, by the time the Troy 7B had been built, uh, these bodies had just been covered over by earth, uh, not in an actual burial, but just from, you know, erosion. And so people had been killed and just left there in the streets. That indicates there was a major attack. But notice the earthquake and the attack happened at different time periods. They happened decades apart. Well, the ancient Greek authors estimated the Trojan War took place around the year 1184. Uh, that is a, a good you know, four or five decades after the destruction of uh, Troy 7a. So these mixed accounts of Troy's destruction by the Greeks and by the gods, uh, especially Poseidon, are a clue that maybe multiple destructions were remembered in oral form, uh, in the oral tradition, where they could have been later uh, aggregated or redacted into a single story uh, five centuries later, when those time differences didn't seem so significant. Now, about the same time that uh, shortly before uh, Troy 6 is destroyed by the earthquake, uh, there's a, a large uh, a construction project happening across the Aegean Sea in the, the city of Mycenae. Mycenae is identified in the Iliad as the city of Agamemnon. Uh, who is the, the chief commander of the Achaeans. Notice they never, they're never referred to as the Greeks, or if, depending on the translation, uh, but the word Greek does not exist yet by when, when Homer's writing the Iliad. Uh, he uses words like Achaeans or Argives or Danaeans. Uh, Argives refers to people from Argos, a region in um, modern day Greece. But this word Achaeans, uh, we have a, a cognate in the writings of the Hittites. Uh, there's a tablet from around the year 1300 BCE where a Hittite king is naming kings that are equal to himself 
uh, around the, the known world. And he includes the Babylonian king and the Egyptian king. Uh, but he also mentions the king of the Achaeans. And uh, on this tablet where he describes the, you know, him, this king of the Achaeans as being equal to himself, he then scratches that out, or whoever writes this tablet scratches that out as if they decided, no, in fact, the king of the Achaeans is not uh, equal to us. But this at least indicates to us that there is this power out there uh, centered maybe at Mycenae, maybe somewhere else. Mycenae is definitely the, the wealthiest uh, and the, the most well-built city of this area. And it's being built with these giant walls, these, these huge stone blocks that you can still see today. Uh, this is a, a, a picture, uh, the main picture here is the, the lion gate of Mycenae. And there was uh, those two things on top of the gate were lions, They're, the heads have been knocked off. But you can still go here today. Uh, the gate is surprisingly short. You know, if you jump up, you can probably touch it. But that's probably because this is a time period when people aren't riding on horseback, they're being pulled in chariots. Um, if you rode on horseback, you might have to duck down to get under the gate. But this is still a huge construction project for this time, which indicates that they're at war with somebody. They need these walls there for a reason, to withstand some sort of siege. But the Mycenaean Empire, if we could say such a thing, it's probably more accurate to refer to it as the Mycenaean civilization, isn't constrained to the landmass of Greece. It's actually uh, influential over this entire area of the Aegean Sea. And that's because at this time, it's easier to travel by sea. You can travel faster by sea than you can travel over land. So even today, if you wanna to go to Mount Athos, which is out on one of the peninsulas of Northern Greece, you have to go there by boat because it's just, the peninsula is just all one big mountain and it's too steep to travel through. So uh, at this time, uh, during the Bronze Age, it's definitely easier to travel by ship. So the Mycenaeans control not necessarily just the land, but this, uh, maritime area, the, the Aegean Sea. And that seems to include most of the areas of, of Asia, mi or Asia Minor, uh, the, the modern day uh, nation of Turkey. And that means that Troy is at the, uh, the edge of the Mycenaean world, is all, and it's also the edge of the Hittite world. And the Mycenaeans and Hittites uh, clearly have interacted with each other. But the interesting thing is, the, because the Mycenaeans control, uh, or at least their civilization is a, uh, a maritime civilization. They're able to tra travel all over the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. They trade with uh, the Egyptians. They trade as far east as with Mesopotamia. Uh, there's Mycenaean artwork found in uh, Mesopotamia uh, in, in Babylon. But there's no Mycenaean artwork or trade goods found in the Hittite Empire. That seems to indicate, uh, even though they were geographically relatively close, that seems to indicate there was perhaps some bad blood, there was maybe a trade embargo, maybe even a cold war between the two. All the way back in uh, around 1400 BCE, there's a Mycenaean sword. Uh, the sword you see on the right is a, a replica of a, a specific type of Mycenaean sword. It didn't look like most of the other swords in, uh, in, in any of the other regions. And it was found inscribed with a reference to crushing the Ashua rebellion. Uh, Ashua being the, the word for Asia, which mainly meant uh, Western Anatolia, Western Turkey. And it seems that uh, a king of the Hittites had dedicated all of these swords taken from uh, the, the people he had conquered, and he was dedicating them to uh, a god by saying, I, I dedicate these swords of these uh, people crushed, the people in Ashua that tried to rebel against the, the Hittite empire. And one of those swords is a Mycenaean sword, so that may indicate there was some sort of alliance between the Mycenaeans and the Trojans, but again, this is 200 years before the time period we're looking at for the, uh, the Iliad. So during this Bronze Age, uh, we have an entirely different political setup from the, uh, around the Mediterranean region than will, will be around during Homer's time. Uh, we have an entire empire that will no longer exist by the time Homer is writing. Uh, shortly after, the uh, destruction of Troy 7a, uh, surprisingly close to the time that the ancient Greeks associated with the Trojan War, uh, in 1178, the Hittite Empire uh, fragments into all these different splinter states and no longer exists as a, as a unified power. This is why by the time the Bible's written, no one knows uh, that the, where the Hittites are located. They just have these uh, people from these like smaller states uh, uh, around the, the Middle East that they're still referring to themselves as Hittites, but no reference to a specific Hattusius or the Hittite Empire. So by the time Homer is compiling the Iliad and the Odyssey, five centuries have passed 
since the, the destruction of Troy 6H and, and 7A and the, the fall of the Hittite Empire. So something happened that could, we could read as an actual Trojan War. But remember, because of these five centuries, we wanna be careful as to how much of Homer we project back into this Bronze Age time period. Remember how we understand history, how the political historian Michael Shudson said that we narrativize history. Uh, we pass on a version of the past, uh, but we, it must be encapsulated into some sort of cultural form, and that's generally a narrative. Uh, we need a beginning, a middle, and an end. We need this original state of equilibrium uh, followed by a disruption and then some sort of resolution of that disruption. We need a protagonist, we need obstacles in his or her way and efforts to overcome those obstacles. Uh, reports of the past observe certain rules and conventions of narrative. An account of the past must choose a point to begin and that's not always easy or obvious. Indeed, it's always to some degree arbitrary. And so we'll look uh, at how Homer begins the Iliad, we, and you read book one, uh, but we'll also look at how this epic cycle uh, of the uh, story of the Trojan War begins. Uh, but then keep in mind that that's just one explanation of, uh, of an original order followed by a point of disruption. Uh, and then its eventual resolution at the end of the Trojan War, perhaps later, depending on the story. Uh, he says, successful narratives often foreground individual protagonists and antagonists rather than structures, trends, or social forces. So uh, with regards of the, the Hittite versus Mycenaean control of uh, the city of Ilios, uh, we can see a definite uh, economic explanations why there would be warfare between the two, fighting over that city to control that city. But of course, the, the Iliad is not about uh, economic forces and the, most of the, the, the cycle of stories about the Trojan War are not about those economic forces because th those are less tangible than a story about a woman who's been taken from her husband and her husband's coming to get her with his army at his back. And so Schudson says, particular works of art or efforts at storytelling may live on in memory in ways that overwhelm less dramatic, less lucid, less epitomized, less narrativized ways of telling the past. Narrativization is a, an effort not only to report the past, but to make it interesting. Narratives simplify. And a version of this, you know, centuries long conflict between these two uh, large civilizations over this one particular strategic fortification uh, probably wouldn't make as good a story as the Iliad does. So who is Homer? Who is writing this narrative, or perhaps not writing this narrative, or telling this narrative, that uh, is our point of access to uh, this conflict that took place five centuries before him. Well, his language seems consistent with around the year uh, 700 BCE, somewhere between uh, 750 and 600 BCE. And this is the time period that was attributed to him by the uh, fifth century Greek sources. So when Plato or Aristotle talk about Homer, they're assuming he came along two centuries before they did. And some of the details he gives about chariot warfare, the the types of uh, weapons used and, and that sort of thing tend to match the, the seventh century. But also, we're, as we're gonna see, some of it goes back uh, even beyond that. Some of his descriptions of, of armor, uh, the fact that he describes bronze armor, uh, even though in his time, uh, iron armor was uh, much stronger and had been, the technology had improved to allow uh, the creation of very well articulated pieces of iron armor. Uh, the fact that he describes certain uh, charioteering tactics that were no longer used in his time period. This indicates that he's maybe inheriting stories from elsewhere. Uh, that there are stories that existed long before him that he could not have known. An oral tradition possibly stretching back to the actual destruction of Troy six or seven. Uh, so here's some of the things that he couldn't have known and yet seems to know when uh, telling the story in the, in the Iliad. Uh, we have this vase, which is frequently called the, the warrior vase. It dates to about the year 1200, uh, around the you know time during or, or shortly after the Trojan War, if there, there was a Trojan War. Uh, even though these characters to us might look kind of cartoonish, the way they're depicted, uh, the, the way their armor looks, their helmets look, uh, that sort of thing, uh, tends to match the descriptions that, that Homer gives frequently. Four times during the Iliad, Homer describes the, in full detail in these sort of stock passages that all sound the same, the full armor that the Mycenaean warriors wear. Uh, but that armor description does not match the armor used in the seventh century Greece. It, it matches what's depicted here on the warrior vase, uh, as well as the, the, the fact that he describes bronze weapons and armor rather than iron weapons and armor, which were much better, but would not come along to much later. 
he never mentions iron weapons except to mention some iron arrowheads, and iron arrowheads would have been easier to make uh, at this time during the Bronze Age. They couldn't quite make swords or spears or uh, much less armor out of it, but they could make arrowheads. Uh, he describes helmets with plumes and horns, and these are things that have uh, fallen out of fashion, that have not been used for a, a century or two um, by the seventh century. Uh, for reasons that'll become obvious once you read book three, when Menelaus grabs uh, Paris by the plume of his helmet, uh, this it, it might look cool on top of a helmet to have this, these big plumes, these horsehair plumes. Uh, at a distance, it might be kind of intimidating, but in close combat, you grab somebody's helmet and you can break their neck with it. Uh, you can you know, seriously dominate somebody once you have a hold of that. So uh, later Greek helmets will not have these, these plumes. By the, by the time Homer's writing, that's no longer used, although it still shows up in, in pottery, uh, depictions of the past. And specifically, later, in a, in a later book that I didn't ask you to read, uh, Odysseus is described as receiving a gift of this boar's tusk uh, helmet. And this would have been not the most efficient uh, not the, the best protection that a warrior could wear, but each one of those boar's tusk, the, or every two of them had to come from a, a single boar, and boars were very difficult to kill, and to make one of these tusks, you would have to kill at least 40, perhaps as many as 100 boars. And, and a boar could, using its own tusk, uh, was famous for actually killing people that tried to hunt it. So this boar's tusk would have been extremely expensive or taken a long time to construct. It was very much a sign of, of status. The thing is, no boar's tusk helmets like this have been found anywhere near Homer's time, but there have been several, uh, not several, but a few found from the earlier Bronze Age, uh, you know, four or five centuries before Homer. And there have also been depictions of warriors wearing a boar's tusk that also come along from the, the 13th or 14th century BCE, which tends to indicate that this story has uh, come down to Homer uh, about uh, this particular type of artifact that no longer existed in his day. So that's not something he's uh, telling us that's about his own day. It's something that definitely comes back, uh, or comes down to us, or comes down to Homer from the Bronze Age. Later, also in the Iliad, uh, Homer describes the, the Achaean warrior Patroclus uh, climbing the walls of Troy. And it's, uh, we're told that three times, in, in book 16 of the Iliad, we're told that three times Patroclus tried to mount the angle of the towering wall. Uh, in other words, he's being, dis uh, not only is, is Patroclus trying to climb the wall, the walls are at an angle. And this was not something that uh, was common, not something you would have seen during Homer's time. Uh, and yet, once Troy had been excavated in the early 20th century, we uh, archeologists found that indeed this wall could be climbed. It was like a really, really steep staircase with really, really narrow steps. So it was something that you could sort of get footholds in and, and climb up. Um, this is not something that Homer could have known because by Homer's time, by the seventh century, all of this was buried underneath a later incarnation of the city of Troy. Uh, it was all underground and it had been replaced by uh, more Iron Age walls which were straight up and down so, and they were smoother so that they couldn't be climbed. Uh, in book six of the Iliad, Andromache tells Hector uh, to drop his people by the fig tree where the wall is most open to attack. She says, you know, for your host, uh, stay by it while the, uh, where the, the city may best be scaled and the wall is open to assault. For three times at this point, the most valiant in the Achaean company had come, but there is a weak spot, it's by the fig tree. And the, the location she's describing has been uh, discovered where uh, after Troy six had fallen, all of the parts of the wall had been reinforced, except there was this one spot on the western side. Uh, and then at the, the main gate, which was the southern gate, there was a tower uh, standing over it, and uh, Homer describes this in book 16. But all of this was buried by Homer's time. There's no way he could have gone there and seen it in the seventh century. So there's a mix of descriptions of weapons, armor, military tactics, and that sort of thing that matches the seventh century in which Homer lived, or in which the, the Iliad was written. There's also descriptions of things which did not uh, any longer exist at, at that place and time, that uh, hadn't existed for centuries. So this mix of descriptions, as well as a few other factors, have led, for the last 200 years, uh, or more than 200 years, have led scholars to wonder uh, if there was a Homer, maybe all he did was compile all these other stories, uh, weave them, redact them into a single poem. Maybe he wrote it down, maybe he uh, just sang it and somebody else later wrote it down. Uh, this has been open to interpretation, 
But there are enough clues in the descriptions of the uh, of the, the culture, of the warfare styles and all of this, but also clues in the strategies used for uh, uh, telling the story. Uh, there's uh, several repetitions where, as I mentioned, the description of, of armor happens four different times in almost the same uh, words. Uh, there are uh, these epithets given to some of the warriors like swift-footed Achilles. Achilles is always described as swift-footed even when he's sitting down and not doing anything. He's not running, he's not on the battlefield. While he's hanging out by the ships, he's still described as swift-footed Achilles uh, for uh, reasons that don't connect to narrating what's actually happening in the story. Uh, these have led to what's called oral formulaic theory. In other words, uh, someone who's seeing this has to m have memorized uh, line by line all of this. So uh, maybe some of these stock passages that are used over and over again actually were a, a strategy for remembering this much longer uh, story uh, in a much more uh, detailed uh, format. That would have allowed these uh, this story to exist over several centuries. But it could have also it could also be that there were several different oral poems that were uh, passed on by these traveling bards who would sing the story, uh, but then all of these different smaller stories were woven together. This shouldn't be too much of a surprise for us by now, given that it's the same thing we've seen in every text we've read so far. Uh, lots of different uh, fragments of stories being redacted uh, at some point in time, and then sometimes that story, that combined story going on to be redacted. Uh, we saw that you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh wasn't always an epic, it came from all of these individual stories. So we have here lots of different story elements being redacted into a single narrative. Now this wouldn't be uh, necessarily a written narrative, but through uh, remembering these oral formulas, uh, a single singer could remember uh, enough of these different tales to, to weave them all together. Um, and that means that over those five centuries between whatever actually happened uh, over several decades in the, the city of Troy or Ilios. Uh, we had lots of stories uh, going out to different places, maybe being combined with stories that didn't have anything to do with uh, elements from that time period. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that the armor described that Ajax, the, the large, you know, one of the strongest uh, of the, the Greek or the Achaean warriors, uh, is described as having this giant tower shield that when he carries it on his back, it goes from his, his ankles all the way up to his neck. Uh, and he's wearing this huge, you know, sort of suit of plate armor, uh, the kind of thing that sounds almost like, you know, later medieval armor. Well, there is actually armor like that that has, has been found, but it doesn't date to the time of the Trojan War. It dates all the way back to 14, 15, 1600 BCE, a good two centuries before the, the most of the rest of the descriptions would, would locate uh, the Trojan War. So it could be that all of these different stories are sort of uh, being told about this same series of events, but then also stories from elsewhere are being combined over all these centuries. And that there are lots of different homers, lots of different individual uh, bards and, and poets that are telling versions of it. And all of those versions get later uh, combined into the same uh, specific narrative iteration that is the Iliad. Uh, it also has, if you read through the rest of the Iliad, you'll see lots of doublets, lots of you know the same stock passages used several times, but then we'll have some inconsistencies in it. Now uh, there are inconsistencies as, as large as uh, you know characters will be killed in battle, and their death will be described very graphically, and then several books later they're alive again. Uh, the sort of thing that could possibly happen uh, even with a single author, as we'll see when we get to Virgil but seems to indicate that uh, there are a lot of different stories being uh, combined, but uh, this is something that definitely required artistic uh, working. It, these this tales wouldn't have just come together in this uh, great poem by themselves without a lot of, a lot of knowledge on the part of the, the, the redactor and a lot of uh, artistic ability on, on the part of that redactor as well. And we know that there are other sources uh, for, of information about the Trojan War. Uh, if you read the entire Trojan War, well, first of all, you, you started with book one, and you probably noticed that uh, there's no description of how it started. We're already toward the, the end of the war. Uh, if you read all the way to the end, you may be expecting to get to the part about how Odysseus uh, builds this giant wooden horse, and they convince the, uh, the Trojans to take it in, and then you know the Greeks are hiding inside, and they come out and kill everybody. Uh, that's not in the Iliad. Uh, the, the death of Achilles, you know, it, it's very, f uh, the famous story about Achilles being 
uh, immortal because his mother, uh, as, a, as a baby, his mother Thetis, the sea nymph, dipped him in the river Styx and his skin became all invulnerable because of that, except where she was holding him by the ankle. So his, his ankle was his vulnerable spot. And then later Paris uh, sh shoots an arrow uh, into his heel. And so his Achilles heel, his weakness, um, is uh, the way he's eventually killed. None of that is in the Iliad as well. In fact, it doesn't appear that Homer even knows of the story of the Achilles heel. Uh, th there is references to the, the Trojan horse uh, later in, in the Odyssey uh, and, and other elements that we're familiar with, but this Achilles heel thing seems to not be part of that. Uh, and from this time period, from the seventh century when Homer's writing, there are several other people that are also writing about the Trojan War. And all of these works together uh, are described as the epic cycle, or the, the Trojan epic cycle. Uh, so this includes the Iliad and the Odyssey, but also includes a lot of works that were not attributed to Homer, they were attributed to other people. Uh, they also, this is where a lot of these uh, assumptions that we have about how the Trojan War happened, what happened before the Iliad, what happened after the Iliad, this is where these come from. The only problem is we no longer have these texts. These texts have not uh, come down to us. But we do have texts uh, from the ancient world that make reference to these, that give us enough uh, descriptions of what happens in them and quotations from them that we can figure out a little bit about what's happening within each one. Uh, the first of these is the Cypria. Uh, it, it describes everything from the, the reasons that the Trojan War uh, began, uh, such as the, the marriage of Peleus and, and Thetis. Now, as I go through this, I'm gonna sort of tell the story of the, the epic cycle that uh, serves as the context of the Iliad. Uh, and to do that, I'm gonna back all the way up to Prometheus. Well, technically, I'm, I'm going forward. Remember in Aeschylus, when Prometheus is, is bound up uh, by Zeus and being tormented, he knows how Zeus is gonna eventually be overthrown. He knows that Zeus is gonna sleep with a woman who's gonna give birth to a son that will be more powerful than his father. And this is Zeus's downfall. Now we figure out from references made to the other plays of Aeschylus that, that haven't survived, but we, f we have enough information to figure out that eventually Prometheus and Zeus are reconciled. Zeus sends Heracles to free Prometheus, and uh, after that Prometheus gives up the secret. And the woman who would have given birth to the, the son who would overthrow Zeus was this nymph, the sea nymph named Thetis. And once Zeus finds this out, uh, he gives Thetis in marriage to a human named Peleus, a human king. And at their marriage, Peleus and Thetis, uh, who by the way are gonna be the, the parents of Achilles, at their marriage, uh, the gods are in attendance as well because Thetis is a goddess. And the sea nymph is, is, is technically one of the, the immortals. And all the gods are invited except one, the, this uh, goddess of discord named Eris, uh, E-R-I-S. And because she's not invited, she's not invited for obvious reasons, she's gonna you know, uh, stir things up, uh, but even not being invited, she stirs things up. She uh, manages to plant or you know, place this golden apple in the midst of this, the festivities of this wedding, and on the, the side of the apple is inscribed, to the fairest. In other words, this is a gift to the fairest of the goddesses. Well, she doesn't name a goddess, that means that three goddesses come to contend over you know, who is actually meant by the fairest. So the goddess Athena, who in this sort of uncharacteristic of her in the story, uh, claims that you know that, that apple was meant for her. Uh, the goddess Hera, uh, the queen of the gods, um, the wife of Zeus, claims that it was for her. And the goddess Aphrodite, the uh, goddess of love, claims that it was for her. And to settle their dispute, they ask Zeus to choose the fairest among them, and of course, he's not going to have any of that. He knows there's a, that's a no-win situation for him. So he throws the apple far away, it lands on Mount Ida, where Paris, the son of Priam, uh, is uh, playing his lyre, his, his harp, uh, while he's shepherding sheep. It should sound familiar, this is what Hesiod says he was doing when the muses came to him. But Paris is on the slopes of Mount Ida, uh, playing his lyre when uh, he finds this apple, and as soon as he finds it, these three goddesses appear before him, uh, and they say, now you have to choose who is the fairest among us. And uh, Athena says, if you choose me, I will give you victory in war and I will give you wisdom. Uh, so, you know, this sounds like a, a good deal, but he listens to see what Hera says. And Hera says, I'll, I'll give you, you know, prosperity and a, a good marriage. Uh, you know, a sort of a, a wholesome marriage, in other words. Uh, but then Aphrodite says, I will give you the most beautiful woman in the world. The, the marriage part doesn't seem to be uh, particularly relevant to, to Aphrodite. Um, and this is what Paris chooses. He's 
not not thinking with his uh, brain in this situation. He chooses, he gives the apple to Aphrodite, and in reward, she has promised him the most beautiful woman in the world, and uh, it doesn't seem to matter to her that the most beautiful woman in the world at the time, Helen, happens to be married to someone else. Uh, she's married to Menelaus, the, the king of Sparta, or the city that will eventually become Sparta, uh, Laodamia, or Lacedamia. And in order to facilitate that, she sends Paris on this uh, sort of diplomatic mission, this visit to Menelaus and Helen. And while uh, Menelaus is away, uh, Paris abducts Helen. And it's ambiguous whether she goes willingly or not, but as we see in book three of the Iliad, uh, she doesn't, you know, Aphrodite is very coercive in resorting to threats to keep Helen with Paris. Well, after she's uh, taken to Troy, uh, Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon, who's king of Mycenae, they gather together all the, the Greek city-states, the Achaean city-states, and they use this uh, provocation to go to war with the Trojans. So the Cypria tells us all of those stories. Uh, it tells us about Agamemnon uh, gathering the, uh, the different uh, kings of uh, the Achaeans, including the, the ways he has to sort of coerce them into going to battle. Odysseus doesn't want to go to battle. He's on the island of Ithaca. Uh, he pretends to be in, in insane uh, when they show up to ask him to come with him. And one of the ways he acts insane is that he yokes together an ox and a horse to pull his plow. Well, you know, the horse is not gonna, not, is not gonna want to pull a plow. It's gonna want to try to break away and the ox is gonna be much slower. So this is just never gonna work. But while he's pretending to plow the field with the ox and the horse yoked to his plow, uh, Agamemnon places the uh, the young child, Telemachus, that we'll see again in the Odyssey, places this, the, his infant son in the path of the, the plow so that you know, Odysseus has to you know, pull back the plow and not, in order to save his son. And uh, so he's revealed as not being, uh, not being crazy, at least uh, not being out of his mind. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, Thetis, Achilles' mother, knows that he's doomed to die if he goes to war, uh, so, he doesn't want, or, so she doesn't want her son uh, going with Agamemnon, so she dresses him up like a girl and uh, puts him with the, the women there. And when uh, Odysseus comes with Agamemnon, they realize that this is probably what's happening, but rather than go you know, uh, unveil all the women, uh, Odysseus lays out a lot of jewelry and clothes o in one place, and then over in another place he lays out a lot of weapons and armor. And of course, all the women go to look at the jewelry and clothes, and all the men go to look at the weapons and armor, but there's this one rather large young lady who's very interested in the armor, and Odysseus uh, figures out that that's Achilles. So they're able to find Achilles and, and, and make their proposition, and he goes with them. And then just to get his soldiers to Troy, Agamemnon has to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia uh, to the, the goddess Artemis uh, in order for her to allow the winds to blow to uh, allow the ships to, to sail to Troy. And this is something that will ultimately cause uh, Agamemnon's wife to kill him, uh, Clytemnestra, when he returns home from Troy. Uh, but that, that happens in a different book. But the sacrifice of Iphigenia and all of these other uh, story, this backstory to the, the Trojan War happens in the Cypria. Chronologically after that then comes Homer's Iliad, uh, which uh, I'll focus in on in a minute. But the Iliad only takes place in the last year of the Trojan War. Uh, but then there's still a lot left happening after the Iliad before the Trojan War ends. So in this uh, other uh, ep epic called the Ethiopis, uh, we have a description of uh, Amazons uh, coming from the east and Ethiopians coming from Northeast Africa to join the Trojans. And Achilles kills the Amazon queen, uh, Penthesilea, on the battlefield but there's this indication that the two of them were lovers first and that it's only because they met on the battlefield and they had no choice that they had to fight to the death. And so it's a very tragic story. Uh, and this is uh, shortly followed by Achilles' own death where he's killed by Paris. That is followed by the Iliad Micra or the Little Iliad. Uh, and this is where uh, Pel Paris is killed by uh, Philoctetes, the descendant of, Achille or the descendant of uh, Heracles. Uh, the son of Achilles, Neoptolemus, has to join the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks are told that they're never going to take Troy unless Neoptolemus, who's also in some text referred to as Pyrrhus, not to be confused with Paris, uh, that Neoptolemus has to join the Greeks if they're ever going to win. And this is where we have the story of the building of the Trojan horse in the Little Iliad. After the Little Iliad is the Iliopersis, which is the, the fall of Troy. Uh, it's here that the Trojan horse is actually taken into the city of Troy. The Greeks come out, open the gates, uh, and 
the, the rest of the Achaeans are able to come in and, and sack the city. Uh, and this is also where we have the rather grim description of uh, Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles, killing uh, the Trojan king Priam, uh, even when he's uh, begging for mercy, uh, and uh, you know, takes away uh, Hecuba and Andromache, uh, Hecuba's Priam's wife, and Andromache is the uh, uh, wife of Hector. Uh, and also in the Iliopersis, we have this description where one of the Greeks pursues one of the priestesses of Athena into the, the temple of Athena, which archeologically we know there was a temple of Athena at the, the, top, of this, um, uh, the uh, top of the city of Troy. And because he rapes this priestess in the temple of Athena, even though Athena has sided with the Achaeans this whole time, this turns Athena against them. And because of this in the, the following uh, epic, the, the Nostoi, which means the returns, Athena sends the storm which scatters the Greek ships. This is why Odysseus gets thrown off course before he gets back to, uh, to Ithaca. This is why Menelaus will be, uh, when he, uh, he and Helen are on their way home to Sparta, they get thrown off course and they end up in Egypt. And uh, Agamemnon, uh, Agamemnon is able to get home rather, relatively quickly, but he and the, the other Greeks that uh, Athena is most uh, angered by, uh, they end up getting home quickly and then getting killed on the way there. So uh, the, the no story is mostly about Agamemnon coming home where he's murdered by his wife Clytemnestra who remember uh, is taking revenge for the death, of the sacrificial death of her, her daughter uh, Iphigenia. Uh, and then of course that puts Agamemnon's son Orestes in the difficult position of having to avenge his father but also having to do that by killing his mother which will be later uh, expanded upon by Aeschylus in the Oresteia, these plays that come from the fifth century uh, fifth century Greece. But another interesting story that's part of the Nostoi is about Menelaus and Helen, who despite what you may have seen in Hollywood versions, uh, Menelaus and Helen are reunited at the end. Uh, they are on their way home, but they end up being thrown off course by the storm, and they end up in Egypt, and they spend seven years uh, having to go to perform the sacrifice uh, to the gods in order to be able to return home, but they return home much wealthier, and clearly they've made up. If you read uh, book four of the Odyssey, you see that when Telemachus goes to Sparta to meet with Menelaus and Helen and ask about where his father Odysseus is, uh, they're clearly, uh, they, they've clearly made up with each other. Uh, after the Nostoi chronologically comes the, the Odyssey, where you know it is Odysseus's journey home, and we'll talk about that uh, next time. And after that is something most people don't uh, may not have heard of, and it's uh, for the reasons that it, it's, it's kind of sad after we've invested so much in Odysseus. Uh, the Telegony, uh, which is named after Odysseus's illegitimate son Telegonus. Uh, Telegonus is the uh, son of Odysseus and Circe. Remember that Odysseus spends a, an, a year on the island of Circe. And while they're together, uh, according to the Telegony, Circe gives birth, or becomes pregnant, and then after Odysseus leaves, uh, she gives birth to the son, and he goes looking for Odysseus, but he gets thrown off course uh, as well, and he comes upon Ithaca not knowing where he is, and he you know, gets in a fight with this man and uh, kills him, and only realizes after that 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 was his father, that was Odysseus. Uh, so he, uh, Odysseus is killed by his own son, uh, his, the son that he didn't know he had, but in order to try to make up for that, uh, Telegony takes Telemachus uh, and uh, Penelope, uh, Odysseus's wife and son, uh, to Circe's island, and they're both made immortal there. Uh, so this is this epic cycle tells us all these things that we uh, don't get from the Iliad, and you'll notice that the the focal characters for most of this, with the exception of the Odyssey and the Telegony, which focus on Odysseus, most of this has to do with Helen and the, uh, her abduction by Paris, and Menelaus is gathering the, the Greeks, Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon, gathering uh, the Achaean forces to come get her back. Starting with the judgment of Paris, starting with you know, this uh, apple, the, this golden apple that Paris is asked to award to one of these three goddesses, uh, and that leading to uh, Aphrodite fulfilling her promise to give him the most beautiful woman in the world, that woman being uh, the married woman, Helen, uh, and her, uh, the, the sort of response of Menelaus, her husband. Uh, this is uh, the sort of consistent thread. If, if we had to pick protagonists for the entire epic cycle, uh, these three, this sort of love triangle would be, uh, these would be the, the, the major characters. But notice they don't figure that prominently in the Iliad and, and several of the other stories. 
Uh, but I asked you to read book three, which doesn't is one of the books that frequently gets passed over uh, because it doesn't really focus on Achilles. Achilles is sitting on the, the sidelines right now. But book three of the Iliad actually deals with this larger story. Uh, this is where uh, Menelaus challenges Paris to a duel. You know, I came here for Helen. If you want to fight me for her right now, whoever wins, the other side just has to, to give up. That would save all of these men uh, from having to fight and die over our conflict. This conflict is between me and you. Let's take care of it in a single duel. And that seems to make everybody happy. Uh, Hector has to prod uh, uh, Paris in order to, to get him to accept this duel. But uh, Paris does accept the duel. Menelaus and, uh, and Paris come together on the battlefield. Uh, you know, Helen is watching from a distance. And notice in book three, uh, Priam is very sympathetic with Helen. There are a lot of people in, in the, uh, the text that, that are angry at Helen, that blame Helen for everything. But these old men of Troy understand that there's more going on. They, they look at Helen and they say, you know, we could blame her, but we're not going to. We understand why. Uh, first of all, why she's so beautiful, why uh, you know Paris would, would risk so much for her, uh, but also why Menelaus would risk so much for her. But they also understand, and particularly Priam understands, that this is the gods at work. And he tells Helen directly, I don't blame you for what's happened here. And as she watches uh, Menelaus and, and Paris uh, duel on the battlefield, and clearly Menelaus has the upper hand. He's the better warrior. Uh, Paris just has really no chance. And this is where you know uh, Menelaus grabs Paris by the the plume on the helmet and drags him around by the head and is about to kill him when Aphrodite intercedes on the battlefield and uh, uh, she's, uh, she rescues Paris. And not only does she rescue Paris, she takes Paris back to his bedroom within the city of Troy and then she goes, to, uh, Aphrodite goes to get Helen and tells her to go back to, literally to go to bed with Paris. And uh, Helen doesn't want to. Helen uh, is, is resistant and she's clearly not fond of Paris at this point, but Aphrodite directly threatens her, don't make me angry at you. you know, I've, tr I've been lenient with you so far, but don't test me. And so she's coerced, she's threatened to, to go to bed with uh, Paris, but she tells Paris directly, I wish Menelaus had won. The better man lost, or at least, you know, I wish the better man had won and you had lost. Uh, so clearly this is not the, the Barbie and Ken story of Paris and Helen that you see in the, the 2004 movie with, uh, with Orlando Bloom playing uh, Paris. Uh, there's, this is a much more complicated uh, love triangle. And there's still the implication that Helen may have gone willingly when she first went with him, but her will is, has been very much influenced by Aphrodite. Aphrodite, whether through direct force, uh, direct threats, or uh, Aphrodite's power over human emotion, uh, one way or the other, this is not uh, a simple story. So Helen doesn't want to be there, but she can't just leave either. Uh, she's not Helen of Troy, she's Helen in Troy. You know, she's uh, an Achaean, she's from uh, Sparta. Uh, you know, that's her identity and her husband was there, but she left uh, that through this combination of her own will or being abducted or uh, being sort of coerced by, by a goddess. Uh, so she's neither Trojan nor Greek. Uh, she's neither willing nor can she just sort of get out and, uh, and and leave on her own. So this decision of Paris, the judgment of Paris that precipitated all of this, the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, uh, all of this happens uh, at the beginning of this 10 year long struggle. And the, the Cypria tells us, uh, goes several years into the, the Trojan War. And of course the Trojan War ends with the Trojan horse and the, the burning of Troy and Menelaus taking Helen back and returning to Sparta. Uh, but notice uh, that the Iliad itself takes place within about 100 days in this last year. So if you look at this timeline, the blue line across the center is a timeline, uh, and each year of the Trojan War is marked. Uh, most of what we associate with the beginning of the Trojan War actually happens before the Trojan War, uh, including Agamemnon mobilizing the, the Greeks and uh, the, the thousand ships that, that Helen sailed. Uh, you know, the face that launched a thousand ships that actually comes from Christopher Marlowe's uh, play Faust, or uh, Dr. Faustus. But that's the way we remember it, but none of this happens in the Iliad. And the story of the Trojan horse, the death of Achilles, all of that, that doesn't happen in the Iliad. What happens in the Iliad is this narrow strip, the red strip there in the middle of the 10th year, uh, and yet it has a certain consistency. Uh, we begin with the capture of Chryseis, uh, this, uh, the daughter of Chryses, the, the priest of Apollo, and Chryses prays to Apollo and says, you know, because the Greeks have taken my daughter, please send this plague, and Apollo sends this plague on the Greeks in order to 
avert this plague, they have to send Chryseis back to her father. And then that leaves Agamemnon angry that he's lost his, his prize. Um, so uh, we start with what might seem like an insignificant event. And we end the, the Trojan War, or in, sorry, we end the Iliad with what seem like, might seem like an insignificant event. Uh, that is uh, Priam coming to Achilles to ask for the body of, of Hector back so he could be properly buried. With all that's going on in the Trojan War, these might not seem like very relevant issues. But uh, we'll see when we look at the narrative as opposed to the story, we look specifically at the Iliad as a narrative, we see its own internal consistency. And that internal consistency is not that it's a, a, an epic about the Trojan War. The Trojan War happened long before it and it will continue after it, after the Iliad. So it's not about the Trojan War. It's also not about Achilles. Remember, all this started with Peleus and Thetis, they're gonna be the parents of Achilles, but yet we don't get much about Achilles' early life uh, in, in the Iliad. Uh, there's a lot about Achilles' role on the battlefield that we're not, never told in the Iliad. Uh, these uh, nine years that happened before this. It's not the Trojan War, it's not about Achilles, it's specifically about what, ha what we're told in the opening lines. Uh, it's not just about Achilles, but the manus of Achilles. Manus is this word for anger or rage, and it's usually trans translated as rage, uh, because in the opening lines, Homer sings you know, this invocation to the muse, sing goddess of the rage of Achilles, but in, in the Greek, the, the first word is rage. Rage, goddess, sing of the rage of Achilles, uh, or uh, Peleus' son. And that word, manus, is not used to describe human rage, or almost never uh, in, in all of Greek literature uh, is it used to describe human rage. It's specifically the rage of gods, uh, this sort of supernatural rage. Uh, this rage is this sort of supernatural uh, characteristic of uh, this character Achilles who is you know, the son of a, a human uh, male but a divine female. Uh, and the beginning of the, the uh, Iliad starts with his rage at Agamemnon. We see uh, this, uh, the fact that Agamemnon takes away Briseis, uh, the, uh, the captive, the Trojan woman that Achilles is taking captive. And Achilles' rage at that causes him to sit out the war for uh, several books of the Iliad. And this might not seem like a big deal, but uh, this, uh, all the, the capture, all the, uh, whatever you're awarded at the end of a battle is part of your teammate, that is the sort of outward honoring uh, it's usually translated as honor, but it's specifically uh, however well you fought, your, uh, the, the treasure given to you uh, will be a sign of the, the honor you've earned. And because uh, they view these female captives and, and any captives as well as any of the, the gold or silver or anything else that are captured on the battlefield, uh, the, the weapons and armor of the slain enemies that uh, they've captured on the battlefield, all of these are outward physical signs of that person's honor, that person's teammate. And because this has been taken away from him, it's Agamemnon saying, uh, you know, you Achilles are not so great, I am greater than you, uh, and humiliating Achilles in his own mind. And so he asks his mother Thetis to have Zeus do something to embarrass the, the Greeks, the Achaeans, so that they realize how important he was. Uh, but while he's sitting, things out on the, sitting out on the battlefield, or he's sitting by the ships while his fellow Achaeans are fighting, uh, this uh, is sort of an act of rage. Eventually, he, the thing that's going to get him out on the battlefield later in the Iliad is when his friend Patroclus uh, goes to fight to help the Greeks because the, the Trojans have gotten so close to the Greek ships that he, he realizes he needs to put on Achilles armor uh, and go at least pretend to be Achilles to sort of raise the morale of the, the rest of the Achaeans. But while he's there, he gets killed by Hector, the most prominent of the, the Trojan warriors and the, you know, the sort of most noble of Priam's sons. And because his friend has been killed, Achilles' rage moves from being at Agamemnon to now being focused on Hector. And he goes, so uh, Achilles goes back onto the battlefield. He eventually has a one-on-one -on -one fight with Hector. He kills Hector, but his rage is not appeased even though he's avenged Patroclus. Uh, so he takes Hector's body back and he ties up Hector's body behind his chariot and he rides around the walls of Troy, dragging Hector's body. Now this is something that's, you know, it's, it's pretty bad from our own point of view, but to the Greeks this was horrible. If you didn't bury a body, then that soul was uh, trapped in this world sort of wandering as a ghost. It, that soul couldn't find peace in the underworld until there was this uh, uh, 
proper burial and whatever you did to that body, uh, there would be the, the remnants of that would show up on the, the soul of the person uh, in the other world. And we see this with Hector uh, later in the, uh, in the Aeneid. He's, he's got all the, the bruises and scars from being dr drug around by uh, Achilles' chariot, even after he's dead. And even the gods uh, show up, and, and that's what you have happening uh, in this uh, painting uh, uh, from this uh, uh, seventh century uh, uh, hydria, this, this water jar. You'll notice a lot of the, the paintings that we have left are uh, part of uh, pottery from this time period. But this uh, image shows uh, Achilles dragging Hector's body behind his chariot. And uh, the gods, you know, Hermes and, and Iris come down to tell him, like, you can't keep doing this. The gods tell Achilles directly or send messengers to say, you have to bury Hector. And eventually he sort of realizes that uh, destroying Hector's body uh, over and over again is not going to satisfy his manus, his anger. And it's only when Hector's father, uh, the king of the Trojans, Priam, comes to him, he sneaks into the Achaean camp. Keep in mind that if, if Priam is, is caught and killed, uh, that, that's pretty much the end of the war. Uh, so he's risking a lot by going into the camp, but he needs to get his, his son's body back. So he sneaks in, in disguise, he goes uh, to Achilles' tent, and he gets down on his hands and knees in front of Achilles. And he takes his hand, he kisses his hand, and he says, uh, you know, I'm kissing the hand of the man who s slain my son and killed many of my sons. You know, never has a father had to uh, do something so uh, pathetic, so humiliating. And yet, he's willing to do this in order to plead with Achilles to, uh, to let him take Hector's body back and bury it. And Achilles thinks about how his own father, Peleus, is going to react when he knows uh, Achilles knows that he's gonna die in battle. His, his mother Thetis has, has told him, uh, you know, if you go back to battle uh, to avenge Patroclus, you're going to die. And he knows that he's not gonna survive and he knows that his own father Peleus is gonna hear the news. And he sees in Priam uh, the sort of image of his own father. And so he's finally moved to sympathy. And it's only then that his manus, uh, his, his supernatural rage finally relents. And that's the close of the Iliad. So the, the framing concept, the framing theme of the Iliad is not the Trojan War, it's not Achilles as a, as a warrior or whatever, it's his rage. The rage from the time it begins at, at Agamemnon to the time it subsides uh, with uh, sort of giving back Hector to, to Priam. But of course when we think of Achilles, we probably think of the fact that uh, he's this sort of unstoppable warrior. He's the greatest uh, warrior of the Greeks and you expect the protagonist of a narrative to be the greatest warrior. Uh, and you may be surprised that most of the books you read, you know, I asked you to read books one and then uh, three through six, uh, only the first one really has anything to do with uh, Achilles. There is this sort of thematic unity to the descriptions of uh, battles, whether it's Achilles on the battlefield or uh, Diomedes, or, uh, which you read about in, in books uh, four and five. Uh, there is this theme of kleos, or glory. So if you, uh, earn time, you earn honor on the battlefield. You're given these rewards uh, that show your uh, that show your prowess on the battlefield. Uh, collectively, this creates your kleos, your glory or your fame. Uh, and this is something that lives on after you. So whatever you do in life, if it's remembered after your death, that's about as close to immortality as any humans are gonna get. There's this idea that there's a particular type of glory that will live forever, that will be uh, imperishable. That is kleos amphthetan. Uh, glory imperishable. And this is an interesting word because it appears to have been in the Indo-European language family for a long, long time. Uh, keep in mind that ancient Greek and, and Latin, uh, as different as they are from each other, they come from a, a language family that is different than uh, like the Semitic languages like Akkadian and Hebrew, uh, also different than you know Eastern uh, Asian languages. But from Ireland or even Iceland all the way east to India uh, where uh, Hindi or Sanskrit, uh, all of these languages have common ancestors. In other words, uh, if you go far enough back, uh, old uh, Celtic languages, Germanic languages, as well as uh, Greek and Latin, as well as uh, ancient Indian language of Sanskrit all come from a, a common language family. And there is this uh, concept in the Sanskrit called Shravas Oxitam. And Shravas Oxitam is Kleos Amphitan. 
Uh, this is the same word that apparently goes way, way back uh, because this is, is in Homer and it's in the, the Indian, the Sanskrit Vedas, these ancient texts that are as old or older than the Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, so this lets us know that this idea of earning honor in life so that you can get the next best thing to immortality, which is to be remembered forever, uh, that is a very old Indo-European concept. But in the reading you did for today, in, in books uh, three through six, it wasn't Achilles' kleos that was the focus. If anything, it was Diomedes. He's the one you see on the battlefield the most. Uh, he's the one that's uh, not just turned into this sort of unstoppable killing machine for most of books five and six, but he's also, uh, he also challenges the gods. He directly wounds um, Aphrodite. When Aphrodite comes to rescue, once again, she comes to the battlefield to uh, intervene, just like she did with the duel between Menelaus and Paris. She comes to intervene when Diomedes is about to kill Aeneas. Now keep in mind, we're gonna see Aeneas again when we get to the Aeneid of Virgil. This Trojan prince Aeneas is the son of Aphrodite and uh, a human, uh, a mortal named Anchises. And Diomedes almost kills him because he's got, you know, he's a great warrior to start with. He's got Athena helping him on the battlefield. But then uh, he's, he's about to kill this noble Trojan until uh, Aphrodite steps in. And he's in such a battle rage that he actually wounds Aphrodite and she has to go running away uh, and, and leave it to her brother Apollo to rescue uh, Aeneas. Uh, and then he comes into contact with Ares on the battlefield. Ares is destroying uh, the, the god of war is there on the battlefield fighting against the Greeks and Diomedes is able to take him on with Athena's help. Uh, Athena becomes, uh, you know, in disguise, Athena uh, becomes his charioteer and she helps guide his spear and so Diomedes actually wounds Ares. But despite the fact that he can kill anybody he wants on the battlefield, he also shows restraint and he, sh he shows us something about the social customs of the Greeks that uh, we might not expect. That is, when he comes across the Trojan named Glaucus, uh, when he finds out, you know, they, they address each other before they go to fight, uh, and Glaucus tells him who he is, and says he's the son of Hippolochus, who's the son of Bellerophon, and Bellerophon's the famous Greek hero who uh, slew the uh, Chimera. And the fact that Bellerophon had hosted Diomedes' grandfather, he'd shown him hospitality in the past, uh, <coughs> that hospitality sh sh created this bond between these two families, and Diomedes recognizes that. He recognizes that, well, your grandfather was a, a good person to my grandfather, so you were my friend. Uh, you know, there's plenty of other Trojans for me to kill out here. There's plenty of other Achaeans for you to kill out here. Let's uh, you know, trade armor to show our friendship and then depart as friends. So this is something we might not expect to happen on the battlefield. For one thing, the warriors introducing themselves to each other before they kill each other. But another thing, uh, the fact that they can say, well, our alliance, the alliance between our two families, supersedes this conflict that we're currently in the middle of. But that sort of direct address between warriors also indicates, or it also shows us something we may not be familiar with in the way we typically think of battle, whether it's modern warfare or even ancient warfare, where you did have to kill the person you know, face to face uh, with, a, with a sharp object or blunt weapon rather than at a distance. Uh, but they knew each other, they knew of each other, and they sort of, uh, and even in the narrative, were given descriptions of who's about to die uh, and who, who they were very often. Even though we're given these really gory deaths, such as when uh, Pandarus is hit with a javelin that goes like through his teeth uh, and like comes out his face, and a particularly gory description, we also find out about who this person is. They're not just sort of nameless thugs uh, or you know these sort of you know <coughs> uh, unnamed characters, the kind you would have in like a, a Hollywood movie where just, you know, uh, Trojan A gets killed by a key and B or, or whatever. We know who these people are. Uh, frequently the readers would know already who these people are. The, the narrative presumes that you know uh, who Bellerophon is and, and that sort of thing. But these characters, even the ones that don't serve a plot, or don't serve a purpose in the, the narrative, uh, even they are given the sort of dignity, given the sort of individuality that uh, we may not that may not be necessary just to tell the story, uh, or especially if you're trying to condense the story, but actually shows respect for the people even as they're being killed. And in the Iliad, we see that nowhere greater than in the depiction of Hector. Uh, in particular, in, in book six, we have uh, Hector going back into Troy to go get his brother Paris, who Aphrodite in book three, you know, uh, carried him back off the battlefield and into his bedroom. Uh, now Hector has to go get him and, and bring him back out on the, the battlefield. But when he does, uh, 
he's confronted when he first enters with all the families of all the soldiers out there on the battlefield wanting to know, you know, is my husband okay? Is my son okay? Uh, and he, he realizes he can't, you know, for, for a lot of them, most of them, or a lot of them, I'm sure the answer is no. Uh, and he says, you know, he, he, he realizes he can't directly deal with this. And then even when he uh, interacts with his own family, we have this very touching portrait of this family that's about to be broken up. You know, though the father and the son are going to be killed. The, the people listening to the Iliad know this. They know Hector's not gonna make it. They know a Steinax, his son is not gonna make it. And yet, we see this, this interaction. They know that uh, Andromache, his wife, is going to be taken into slavery by Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles. But yet, we have this really, you know, intimate, uh, scene where uh, Hector, where Andromache is asking Hector not to go back onto the battlefield and he says, you know, I have to, I have, you know, there are other families here that have to be protected. Uh, and he goes back and forth between saying, well, you know, we're not gonna make it, uh, sort of realizing that, th that the, the Trojans are doomed, but then also saying, I hope my son grows up to be a better man than I, so he's still not sure whether uh, uh, his wife and his son are gonna survive. And he reaches out to you know, take, take up his son, a Steinax, to, to hold him, and he's still wearing his helmet with the horsehair plumes on it, and the sort of movement of these plumes uh, makes a Steinax cry, and he's afraid of his father, so he has to take this helmet off in order to hold his son to show that you know, I'm a human, I'm not, I'm not a warrior, I'm not a sort of like, you know, battlefield god or something. I, I, am a, I have a face, I you know, have this uh, sort of human identity. So he's gotta take that helmet off and be not Hector the, the Prince of Troy, the warrior, but uh, Hector the father. Uh, all of this knowing that, you know, uh, with the reader knowing, or the, the reader or the person who might be listening to this poem, knowing that Hector's not going to make it. Uh, he really has this sort of well-developed character. And keep in mind that uh, this is written in Greek by the descendants of the Greeks. This is not a, a Trojan uh, poem, not written by Trojans. Uh, we could understand later why maybe Aeneas wants to uh, portray the, the Trojans uh, this, this intimately, but this is portraying a foreign people, a people that were uh, locked in conflict. Um, you know, Homer is writing as a Greek who is not the inheritor of the, uh, Hector's Trojan culture. He is the inheritor of the Greek uh, culture of Achilles and Odysseus and Agamemnon, but he is very sympathetic with Hector. And in this, as in these other smaller cases, Homer takes death seriously. It's not just a, uh, it's just not, not all just carnage. Um, they're not all just these sort of faceless bodies that are being uh, cut down to show how great uh, heroes like Achilles or Diomedes are. They have identities, they have uh, personalities, and their death is still tragic even if it's necessary on the battlefield. And so this is what the Iliad is. It's uh, not the whole Trojan War, it's not just uh, Achilles. Uh, in fact, it digresses from describing Achilles quite a bit. To fill in this part of this larger epic cycle, uh, but particularly uh, a character portrait uh, about Achilles, the rage of Achilles from the time it's uh, caused by, by Agamemnon uh, to the time it's sort of satiated by the, the pleading of Priam, uh, <coughs> all of whom are sort of doomed to die uh, after th this narrative is, is completed. But their you know, lives and deaths, and even their chaos to some extent is not the, really the point of this particular narrative. And it's not just to give the plot of the Trojan War. This is one thing that set the Cypria apart from the Iliad. Uh, later when Aristotle writes his poetics, his, his uh, guide to the way you know, writing ought to be, what makes a good story and what, what makes not, not as good a story, uh, is the fact that the Cypria tried to tell everything. It tried to tell the, the lead up to the war and the, the nine years uh, ahead of the Iliad, and it tried to cram too much in and it was just not connected. There was no unity. Uh, the, there was lots of plot, lots of things happened, but there was no really coherent narrative frame. Whereas with the Iliad, it is the rage of Achilles that's, that allows Homer to pick out these elements uh, for description in the Iliad. And once that rage is satiated, he doesn't have to go on and tell about the Trojan horse or the death of Achilles or anything like that. So we'll continue on next time with the Odyssey, uh, or with uh, parts of it, parts of it you probably haven't read before. Uh, book one and then books five through eight. Uh, this is not about the adventures of Odysseus, this is about the, the lead up to the time he tells that tale. 
But uh, if you're interested in more about the Iliad or the Trojan War, or the archaeology of the Trojan War, there are uh, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites for uh, the, the Hittite capital of Hattusha, uh, the city of Troy, the city of Mycenae. Uh, the, the best single website for uh, the archaeology of the Trojan War is probably at the University of Cincinnati, uh, their Troy Project uh, uh, website there. Uh, there's also a great lecture uh, put up on the, the Penn Museum uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is by uh, the curator of the uh, Penn Museum's uh, section dealing with uh, this part of the world, uh, talking about the, the archaeology of around Troy and asking, you know, was there a Trojan War? Uh, as far as the text itself, uh, there are probably easier translations than the one that uh, I posted online. Uh, the one that's online on uh, theoi.com is, is free, but it's also a much older translation from about 100 years ago, so the language is very difficult. Uh, there are translations by Robert Fitzgerald and uh, Robert uh, Fagels uh, that are easier to read. I've also posted links to one by Ian Johnston, and uh, this is kind of difficult to read online because they have this JavaScript thing where you turn the pages, but it's uh, hel it's easier to read in the sense that it has the speeches indented, so it's it's always clear when the narrator's talking versus when one of the characters is talking and when that character concludes talking. Uh, so in some sense, it's it's a bit easier to read. The Penguin Classics version by E. V. Ryu. Uh, that was recently edited by Peter Jones. Uh, also has markers or uh, marginalia that help you figure out who's talking at what point. That tends to be the hardest part about reading the Iliad, is figured out, figuring out who's talking when. If you want to read the uh, different fragments of the, the epic cycle, the, the other stories about the Trojan War, uh, you can see that on theoi.com as well. And I highly recommend this online class that, and also book called The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours. In this, uh, Harvard professor Gregory Nagy uh, takes you through the different ideas like kleos, so the things I told you about kleos and, and manus and that sort of thing, uh, individual Greek terms that he traces the history of. He looks at the context across lots of different uh, examples of Greek literature. Uh, there is a, a book by, that you could buy by itself it's called The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours. But then there's also this online course that's on edX, if you go to edX.org, uh, where he sort of explains, you know, directly through lecture, but also uh, through conversations with other uh, scholars, uh, th these different concepts as they show up across Greek art and literature, but specifically in the Iliad and the Odyssey.